Hi, and welcome to Issues and the Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. I am Huma Dimak, and joining me today is Mr. Regis Chapman, who is the Country Director and Representative of the World Food Program, Multi-Country Office for the Caribbean. And we're going to have an interesting discussion with him um, on the work that he's doing, of course, in St. Lucia and the rest of the Caribbean, the work that the World Food Program is doing in St. Lucia and the rest of the Caribbean. Mr. Chapman, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you today. Thank you for having me. A pleasure to be here. Nice. Um, you know, to set this, the tone for this conversation, um, I would love to start with you just highlighting, giving us a little bit of insight into um, the work of the World Food mm -hmm. Program. What do you do? Yeah. So um, the World Food Program is a United Nations agency. Um, this year actually, actually marks 60 years from when, when the World Food Program was founded. Um, and, and around the world, we are assisting people in 120 or 123 countries and territories, and, and we're meeting the immediate needs of, of people in emergencies. Um, the World Food Program is the largest humanitarian agency saving lives and, and what we say changing lives as well. And, and really our emphasis here in the Caribbean is, is largely around that changing lives agenda. So how do we support governments uh, in the Caribbean to strengthen some of their systems to better, better assist their populations? Um, at the same time, we also maintain that capacity to respond to emergencies and, and, um, and support government-led responses when, when, when that's needed. And, and obviously in a region like the Caribbean with climate change, um, you know, that risk is, is, is always there. As you know very well, we spend sort of six months on, on that nice edge wondering if, if this will be our year. And, and, and that obviously impacts the development of, of countries within the region, and St. Lucia is no exception. Um, so our, our work here is really around, as I mentioned, strengthening systems. Um, what we've been doing in the Caribbean is, is essentially taking WFP's global capacities, but really ta tailoring them to the context here in the Caribbean and, and supporting governments to strengthen their social protection systems, disaster management systems, and food systems, really all to be more resilient in light of, of climate change. Right, and you know, you're bringing up the concept of climate change, and um, you know, one of the, the things that you think about when it comes to climate change, and like you rightly mentioned, um, the food systems is food security, mm. um, and I can imagine that your work um, surrounds that quite a bit. Um, when we think of food security um, for the benefit of our audience, can we highlight, um, you know, the importance of ensuring especially places like St. Lucia, small island developing mm -hmm. states, that we're in the right place or we're on the right track when it comes to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really an interesting discussion. So we opened our office, our multi-country office for the Caribbean in mid-2018, and it was really the aftermath of the 2017 hurricane season where, of course, Irma and Maria caused so much devastation around the region. And when we opened that office, um, I very rarely spoke about food security. It really wasn't on the agenda of governments or people. And, and what we've seen over the last few years, obviously with COVID-19, with the war in Ukraine, food security has become a very real issue in the Caribbean, including in St. St. Lucia. Um, and, and we all see it. We see it when we go to do our, our shopping in the grocery stores and you notice the difference at the, at the pump. Um, cost of living has just skyrocketed. And, and so uh, food security, I think, has a bit more of a face to it now in the Caribbean than it perhaps has had in, in, in many years. Um, WFP has been working with the CARICOM Secretariat since the onset of COVID to conduct a series of food security and livelihood surveys. And, and again, at the, what we've seen over five rounds of these surveys is how the situation has shifted. So that first round of surveys was done in, in really the early days of COVID-19 in April 2020. And we saw people were struggling to access food, but it was because of the restrictions and the lockdowns. And, and you remember all those rules that countries all put in place well. about, you know, what days you can go shopping and, and by last name and, and different, different sort of solutions to reduce, you know, the number of people uh, interacting. And, and so those mitigation measures to, you know, to mitigate that the health impacts had all these socioeconomic impacts. And, and so those first rounds of the surveys really reflected that. And I think what we saw in the first, first round is that virtually everyone was taking the same measures. We were shopping less frequently, we were stocking up a little bit more, um, and we were taking these, these approaches, and, and virtually everyone was able to do that. 
as we got to the second round and the third round, we began to see more of a split between the haves and the have-nots, right? So um, wealthier segments of populations kept doing that, you know, larger bulk purchases, having many days or weeks worth of food at their house. Poor households began to struggle to do that. And, and as we then got to the post-Ukraine um, war uh, survey round, what we really began to see is the affordability issue. And, and so, again, it continued to impact more those that were of lower income levels and higher income levels, but, but really the depth of, of the crisis of, of, you know, at that stage, three and a half years of, of economic downturn and, and impacts of COVID and the war in Ukraine was really pushing more and more people into food insecurity. And so that last round of, of the survey, we estimate that there were 57% of the English-speaking English -speaking Caribbean were, were food insecure. And I mean, that's just, every time I say that, it, it sort of, I, I doubt myself, right? It just doesn't make sense. We're talking about you the English-speaking Caribbean. Right? And 57%, yes. and it's such a staggering, staggering number. Um, but again, if you go into the grocery store today, you, you can very clearly understand why, why that number is what it is. It's just the cost of living has, has skyrocketed and that on the back of those impacts of COVID-19 with job loss, income loss, um, obviously reduced revenues, um, governments, including in St. Vincent, St. Lucia, have had to obviously increase their expenditures at a time where, where their income was also reduced. So you didn't have tourism in the same way. Uh, obviously, that's now recovering, fortunately. But we had those years where there was, you know, tourism was impacted. And, and so a lot of sources of revenue were reduced. But with a growing percentage of population in need, governments had to respond as they did here in, in St. Lucia. Oh, very true. Um, I know while you're speaking earlier, I had the, the question, you know, coming into the each Caribbean country, um, while we Understand, understandably, a lot of the Caribbean countries, we face the same vulnerabilities. Um, in terms of working with the governments, how, how do you set out um, the plan as to mm -hmm. what do you tackle first or, or understanding what needs to happen as you go country by country? Yeah. So really a unique experience, the World Food Program in, in the Caribbean, and, and it's because you know, that, as I said, reflecting after the 2017 hurricane season, while I think the World Food Program, we did a lot right in mm -hmm. those responses, mm -hmm. there were things that could have been done better, as there always are, right? But that lack of real understanding of the countries we were supporting, I think, impacted our ability to deliver our assistance in the best way possible. And, and we learned quickly as we were going along, but the more you know in advance, the better, right? And so when we opened the office, it was really a blank slate. We've worked with a number of the countries in the Caribbean, including um, St. Lucia, but many years in the past. And, and I, I still remember meeting some of the government officials as I traveled around and, and really, you know, ones that had been in government for many years, they would sort of say, yeah, the World Food Program, we remember you, you helped us with our school feeding program in the 80s, or, or you helped us with something else in the 70s. And, and, and it had been um, several years that we weren't present. So what it allowed us to do is, is one, again, there were no preconceived ideas of what the World Food Program should do. And there were no, from either side, from the government side or from our side. And, and so it allowed us to really create more of a demand-driven approach. And, and that allowed us to tailor how we ap apply those capacities of the World Food Program in each country. And, and so um, I mentioned you know, that we're supporting the strengthening of social protection, disaster management, and food systems. Um, the social protection and disaster management systems were sort of the beginning of, of that work. Uh, St. Lucia was one of the a handful of countries where we had done some evidence generation work around both the social protection and disaster management structures. Um, just before COVID struck, I was, I was here in, in St. Lucia and we were having sort of a, a consultation on that, that research that was done to begin to map out what we would do with, with with uh, the government of St. Lucia. Obviously then the world changed when, when COVID break, broke out and we all closed uh, airports and borders and, and that engagement became a bit more of a challenge, but it gave us that foundation on which to continue to engage with the government here and, and, and supportive people. And so when COVID-19 broke out, there was, as I mentioned, you know, there's this sudden increasing need of people within any country in the world that needed support. And governments around the world, including here, 
use social protection systems and programs as one of their tools to respond to, to those growing needs. Um, we've had a lot of different experiences in the different countries where, where we've worked. But here in, um, in St. Lucia, what we did, the government was trying to expand its public assistance program. And so we helped bring some of the more traditional humanitarian resources that the World Food Program uh, is oftentimes able to access, along with some other resources that we had to help the government to, to be able to make that expansion in a much quicker time frame than they had uh, you know, originally foreseen. Um, so we helped to the government to expand that program by, I think, around 1,000 people during the midst of COVID-19 and, and those socioeconomic impacts. And so, you know, already having had that engagement, we, we understood some of those systems and the priorities of the government, and we were able to adapt and, and provide that initial assistance. Oh, wonderful. You know, you mentioned the COVID-19 period, and you so rightfully mentioned um, during that time, it, it the way that COVID hit us, um, one of the things that it did is really showed our vulnerabilities, um, a lot of our deficiencies. And um, one of the things for me um, that I took away um, is the importance of sustainability and being mm -hmm. self-sufficient. Um, in terms of the work of the World Food Program, um, supporting St. Lucia, of course, the rest of the Caribbean, um, you've mentioned that you assist the government when it comes to um, such um, but when it comes to, again, um, touching on food security and it, its mm. importance as a, a, as a country, um, can you highlight anything that the World Food Program has done? Because yeah. food systems, like you mentioned, is one of the things that you do um, that assist in that regard. Mm. Again, another good question. As, as I said before, you know, food security wasn't really on the agendas in COVID-19. I think, I think COVID-19 did a couple of things in terms of exposing some of the vulnerabilities. One, it reminded us that this is really a, a multi-hazard environment, the Caribbean, right? Susceptible to economic shocks. Um, I, I remember saying in those beginning days, it doesn't matter if we have one case in the, in, the, in the Caribbean or zero cases or a million cases, those socioeconomic impacts are stemming from, you know, the, the reliance on, on, on you know, specific economic sources of, of revenue, so tourism or, or services. And, and so, you know, kind of singular economies suffered, obviously, because, because the source of that economic revenue was, was to a large degree cut off. Um, and at the same time, we then, during the midst of COVID, obviously had the uh, volcanic eruption in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, which didn't just impact St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We had Asheville and Barbados. I think you had some here in St. Lucia we did, as well. Yes. Um, and then obviously the impact there. So I, I think, you know, the last couple of years has been that reminder that, that there are multiple vulnerabilities here in the Caribbean. And, and oftentimes, you know, people were just looking at those large scale hurricanes and perhaps 2017, you know, set that stage for us to, to kind of look at it in that way. Um, but, you know, susceptible to earthquakes. Um, you know, you have Kickham Jenny here. Uh, you know, we have, we have a number of different hazards and again, this economic hazard. So I think that was, that was one part of it. And I think the other part is that COVID-19 and then I think the Ukraine crisis kind of doubled down on this, uh, really exposed the fragility of food systems in the Caribbean. Um, you know, across the, the Caribbean, around 80% of food is imported. Um, I think if you, that takes into account, you know, a Guyana, which, which is a net exporter, uh, Belize and, and, and also Suriname, which produce quite a lot. If you take those three out, the, the level of imports is just, it's, it's quite significant, right? Um, so, you know, it, 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 and this is why, you know, the food price crisis that we're having now, is likely to stick around in the Caribbean a bit longer than it will in other parts because it's how, you know, those prices gradually trickle down the line and, and make it to sort of end consumers. And, and here in the Caribbean, the end consumer is a lot further away from, from where those, those foods are produced. So the CARICOM Secretariat has been focusing on what they call the 25 by 25, which is reducing food import bill by 25% by the year 2025. And it's something that we've been engaging with them at the, at the regional level on. Um, I think as we look at specific countries, and including St. Lucia, there's a couple of areas. So one, again, food systems are not just the production, right? And I think what's extremely important is also the consumption side. And so as I mentioned before, 
with those five rounds of surveys we've conducted, affordability is really the issue right now. People can't afford a healthy diet. And, and to begin with, the Caribbean has the most expensive healthy cost of a healthy diet in, in anywhere in the world, I believe. Um, it's, so it's, it was already an expensive diet, and now with food price increases it's, and fuel price increases, it's even more. And so what we need to look at is not just how do we produce more, but, but how do we make it more affordable and how do we support people that are struggling to, to be able to purchase the food that they need. Um, so we're working alongside um, partners like the FAO and, and, and governments to look at how do we link some of these social services with agricultural services as well. Um, what we're trying to do is look at opportunities whereby uh, you know, people that are reliant upon social assistance are also able to access livelihoods opportunities, um, and some of those may be in agriculture. But I think there's another important aspect, which is it's, it's what we consume. So it's not what we can afford, but it's also what we can consume. And, and um, you know, I was talking today with colleagues about breadfruit consumption in Barbados versus breadfruit consumption here and, and different things here versus different things there. And there's not enough of that, right? We're, we go into the supermarket and we're buying our processed goods that are imported and we're not eating what we're growing. And, and this is a big part of that 25 by 25 campaign is, is about eating what you grow and growing what you eat. I and agree with that completely, Mr. Chapman. And I think, you know, I would like for us to hold that thought because I think that is a, a discussion in itself. Um, of course, you're watching Issues and Answers on the Government Information Service. Stay with us. We'll be back and we'll continue with this discussion. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security and Rural Development continues placing heavy emphasis on the concept of food security. It's our prosperity, our future. The Crop Production Unit conducts surveillance and monitoring for transboundary pests and diseases of quarantine importance for St. Lucia. It provides technical assistance in the areas of post-harvest technology, agro-processing, and soil and plant tissue diagnosis. The unit facilitates prudent management of agrochemicals and toxic chemicals in an environmentally friendly manner for sustainable development. Soil analysis is also being carried out. Need further assistance on crop production? Contact the Senior Research Officer at 468-5601. And welcome back to Issues and Answers. We're having a conversation with Mr. Chapman, Regis Chapman, who is um, the country director and representative of the World Food Program Multi-Country Office for the Caribbean. And it's just been such an interesting um, conversation with Mr. Chapman. These type of interviews I don't want to end at all. <laughs> <laughs> but prior to the break, we were talking about the importance of um, you know, being self-sufficient, but um, even more so ensuring that um, it's not just a, a, how do you put this? You don't rely on policy alone to try mm -hmm. to fix issues of food security, but um, you look um, inwards in country and you um, kind of make wise consumption decisions. Is that a, a, a good way to put it? I, th I think it is. So, I, you know, I, th I think we need to be realistic in expectations as well, right? Um, I don't think it's, it's uh, a realistic expectation to say that, you know, St. Lucia or, or Dominica or Barbados or a small island developing state is going to become fully food sovereign, right? In other words, grows all of its own food that it needs. Um, so, so we do need to be realistic about what those expectations are. But again, uh, going back to, to what you eat is, is a critical part of it. And those COVID-19 uh, food security and livelihood surveys that I've mentioned, one other thing that we tracked was how, much, how many people are, are looking at you know, agricultural production or, or engaged in fisheries. And what we've seen is a lot more artisanal production as well. So, so people starting backyard gardens that weren't doing that before. And that spread across income groups as well. So it wasn't just that coping strategy, but you know, I, I mentioned the food prices and you notice a difference, but you also notice a difference in the quality of goods that are on those, those, those shelves as well, right? And I think this l relates to the challenges with supply chains around the world right now. So I don't think we're getting some of those fresh fruits and vegetables coming from outside of the countries 
arriving in the same time frames that they used to. So, uh, you know, we're also seeing a quality issue, and I think that's helped to, you know, rejuvenate this desire of many households to 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 have their own backyard gardens or, or chickens or whatever else uh, uh, people are doing to to kind of cope. But but I do feel that there is a bit more of a a fundamental challenge in terms of the types of diets that, that we've become accustomed to and, and again the reliance on on what are good. So I, I, you know I think there is a bit of that balance. Um, you know we, we engage in a number of countries with, with ministries of education and agriculture on their school feeding programs and I think this is a real good opportunity for how do you integrate locally produced foods within to diets of young children but we also need the parents back home to reinforce those messages as well because some of these behaviors and, and consumption preferences really start at a very young age so so how do we you know take a, a more of a whole of society approach to to begin to to create that pride for these these wonderful caribbean foods that that we have on offer but 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 again we're not we're not choosing to consume in the same degree that we were before Agreed. Just by listening to you speak, Mr. Chapman, I can tell that the work of the World Food Program can align to um, many of the ministries that we have here. You've touched on health, you've touched on um, agriculture, and more so we know that you do have a collaboration um, with the Ministry of Equity um, currently with the limited time that we have for this interview. I'd love to be able to, to touch on that um, a little bit um, more about the work that you're currently doing with the Ministry of Equity. Yeah. So again, we've been working with the Ministry of Equity since since we began working in, in St. Lucia. Um, I'd say it's our, our primary counterpart within the government up till now. Um, so there's all the work that we did during COVID-19, but we're in the process of, of ironing out, let's say, the next two years of, of work that we plan to do with the ministry here. Um, a lot of it involves around strengthening those social protection systems to better fulfill their normal role, in, in other words, their normal times, but also to be what we call shock responsive. So when an event happens, whether that's an economic shock or, or a natural hazard or, or something else, that those systems can scale up and provide assistance to people who need it. Um, we've been working with the government to do a household vulnerability index. So again, really deepening the understanding of vulnerability at, at that household level. So we talk about vulnerability before in the Caribbean, but we're really looking at it at that macro level, right? The risk of a storm or the risk of a volcanic eruption or you know, rising sea levels or whatever we want to look at. But my vulnerability may be very different from your vulnerability. So also understanding those household dynamic, dynamics particularly in the case of a ministry of equity that, you know, with their social workers are, are assisting those, those most vulnerable households. So a lot of work around that, that analysis and some of the targeting work and developing standard operating procedures so that, you know, those systems can scale up and, and, and meet additional needs. Um, and then some more innovative work around digitalization and, and testing out digital payment mechanisms. Um, so during Hurricane Elsa, we supported uh, uh, assistance to impacted populations using a digital transfer tool as opposed to the traditional transfers that take place. Nice. Um, I feel like we've only touched just on a, a minute amount of the work <laughs> that the World Food Program does. Um, and I'm really interested in finding out, you know, what more that you do. And I'm very sure that there are members of our viewing audience that might feel the same. Um, to be able to find out more about the work of the World Food Program, um, to get more information, uh, what is the best course of action to do so? So you can follow us online. Our, our Twitter is um, WFP underscore Caribbean. Um, we have a Facebook page. Um, if you just search for the World Food Program, uh, you'll see all the work that we're doing here around the Caribbean. Um, we also uh, have our, our, our website, WFP.org, and, and you can see what we do all around the world. Uh, but you can also select the Caribbean and, and see the specifics of what we're doing here. Oh, very nice. And is there anything um, throughout this interview that you may like to leave with our audience? Anything um, that you know I may not have asked and that you think is important to mention? No. Look, I think um, again, food security is, has really you know grown in terms of, of the importance, and, and uh, I think there's we all have a part to play, right? And so there's obviously government policy that can be adopted or strengthened to to really reinforce. Uh, food security within the country, um, you know, budgetary allocations to programs that that 
help, you know, help address some of the food insecurity and some of the vulnerabilities that we see. And at the same time, you know, a call on people to, to do their part, to do our part to, as parents, as, as you know, mentors of, of, of youth. You know, how do we make sure that youth are engaged in agriculture? How do we make sure that our kids are eating a healthy diet? And a lot of that starts at home. Very true, Mr. Chapman. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you so much um, for joining me for this conversation. Of course, I know that this is not um, the last time that I will be speaking with you, hopefully. Um, so wishing you the very best, of course, um, with your work here in the Caribbean and um, wishing the World Food Program the very best and continue doing the good work that you guys are doing. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. You're welcome. Uh, this has been Issues and Answers on the Government Information Service. Of course, um, you know, you could always stay connected with us and you can follow us on our social media pages of the Government of St. Lucia. Until next time, I'm Huma Dimak.